Hey Sword Fam, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be giving you a guide on how to choose a fencing mask for HEMA. What you're looking for is um, a mesh mask. A lot of people ask, oh well why don't we use helmets? A um, couple reasons. One, helmets are extremely, extremely expensive. Um, two, HEMA most of the time, unless you're doing like harness fectin, is trying to simulate bloss fectin. Now of course I'm coming at this from a Germanic perspective, um, but a lot of HEMA is meant to simulate unarmored fighting. So that's why we use a lot of like low gear and we don't use like steel armor, for example. In which case then, we use a fencing mask um, and that is because it is the safest way to keep our eyes and throats and heads safe from cuts and thrusts without having to totally skip over the bloss fectin and go right into armored fighting. When you're buying a mask, I strongly, if at all possible, recommend that you ask maybe other friends in your HEMA school or HEMA club to try on their masks and kind of see what size fits for you. Um, it's really hard to kind of guesswork it, and it's such a bummer when you get a mask and <laughs> you bought the wrong size. It's too big or it's too small, and, and that always sucks. So if you can, try on masks first, um, but if you don't have that option, there are size guides and I usually try to size on the, on the bigger side rather than the smaller side because um, you can wear a gel liner cap underneath, which I highly, highly recommend. Um, and I would rather have that little extra room to accommodate a concussion kind of protection or like a skull cap or like a, a gel cap as opposed to having it be just too small, right? Um, so that is something to consider. Other considerations are removable and washable liners. So some masks have totally built-in liners and the liner is here on the inside and that's all the padding here that you see. In this case, these are riveted in and it is not removable. So I can pull on it and it's not coming out. However, some masks actually do have a feature where all of this is like Velcroed in and you can take it out and it is entirely machine washable, which is awesome in terms of like sanitation and hygiene. You're in that mask all the time, you're sweating, you're sweating, you're sweating, and then you put it back on every time. Um, obviously having a really good gear spray or a disinfectant really does help, um, but if you can get a removable liner, that's awesome. And then you can replace that liner if it ever rips, um, as it gets kind of grungy and you just pop a new one right back in there. So that's a really nice feature to consider if that is something that you're interested in. The other thing to consider is the Newton rating of the mask. So a lot of people like to talk about what type of Newton rating is absolutely essential. And people usually think that it actually has to do with the mesh and it doesn't. So your Newton rating is for the fabric here on the bib of the mask. Now this is really, really important that it's Newton rated. Um, it is the level of pierce resistance that it provides or like the amount of like resistance it'll provide to penetration from a sharp object. So something that has a very acute and very small amount of surface area like a sewing needle, that will go through the fabric. However, something that has a little bit more surface area and isn't as acute, such as like a broken sword, will not penetrate the fabric and therefore keeps your throat a lot safer. Now of course that doesn't totally negate the absolute requirement of a gorget, you should always, always, always have a gorget and then your jacket and then the bib of your mask and that's three layers of protection just to keep you safe. What I have found is that not all mesh is created equal. So we're going to compare these two masks. Um, one is a PVT historical fencing mask, one is the absolute force. I really like PVT historical fencing masks so this is not me like dumping on them or anything, um, but it is something to consider. So the mesh on this mask has a lot more dense um, and a lot of like more crush impact, whereas the absolute force does not. And these have probably been through a similar amount of sparring, similar amount of tournaments, um, and the PBT obviously took more of a beating. From a safety standpoint, you could argue that the PBT is actually better. Um, when the mask is absorbing the impact and it's crushing in, that is a huge amount of force that you are not receiving that's not moving through the mask into your person. So as this crushes, it's like a, like a vehicle, right? Vehicles are built with crush points in order to absorb the impact and the energy there as opposed to it going into you. So 
from that aspect, this is maybe safer for concussive forces. However, the downside to this means that the more that it crushes and the more that it receives impact, the more like, likely it'll be for you to need to replace this quicker. Um, as it gets those dents, obviously the mesh warps, there becomes stress points, and that's where it's more likely to break in the mesh, so you might want to replace this more frequently. So there's that. However, with the AF mask, you won't have that same kind of problem in terms of needing to replace it as much, but you will more likely have that energy from cuts going into your person. If your mask is fitted correctly to you, it fits very snugly on your face, it's not moving around or like getting pushed around, then that's less of a concern, it'll sort of just absorb in a good way. If it's moving around on your face and it doesn't fit right and there is some play in the mask, that's where it becomes a little bit more dangerous. That's where you have the opportunity for the mesh to get pressed into your face, especially on the high points of your face, and create like impact cuts or pressure cuts, and those bleed like crazy. So when you get a mask, you really, really should be considering getting an overlay with it as well. Um, it's, they can be sold separately or they can be sold together. I prefer having a separate overlay, and there's a couple reasons for that. First, the overlay is exactly what it sounds like. It overlays the mask. <laughs> so basically, it covers up this back portion here, and it just goes over like this. A little elastic on the front to hold it on. And what it does is it gives a little bit extra protection down the back at the top of the neck and just a little bit of the upper spine. But the big thing is that it closes out the open part of the mask on the back. Overlays are also required for tournaments, so that's an incentive to buy one. But in terms of their safety and the protection that they offer, they have a little bit of padding. And they're usually made of materials like um, cotton, linen, or in this case, um, leather, I think, or suede. And that helps with the impact resistance a little bit as well. It helps disperse the force um, across it, and it'll absorb those cuts in an easier way than the mesh would. So it helps sort of like soften the blows. And the other thing too, and this is more of a tactical thing, um, <laughs> what I really like is you can't hear cuts <laughs> uh, as much. So if somebody kind of hits your head, they'll hear it scrape on the mask, but they won't hear it as much <laughs> on, on the overlay, but that's not really as important. The other reason I really like overlays that are not attached is that if you take a thrust and it gets caught under the overlay, the overlay will come off and it won't get stuck. And it, it might pop off and it looks very dramatic in a tournament and that sucks, but it's safer. When you have something that's attached, like this one for example, What'll happen is the thrust will come in, get stuck underneath, and it has nowhere to go. And if that mask is fitted properly, it's gonna pull your whole head back. And that's where you see those kind of snapping and they get stuck. And that's very, very uncomfortable. And in some cases, a little bit unsafe. So for that reason, I prefer the detachable overlays that are separate as opposed to the ones that are attached. My personal opinion is that for the attached overlays as well, I think it's harder to tell when you need to replace your mask. So if your mask ends up taking damage or the seal starts getting separated, you can't remove the overlay to check on it. So you have to just sort of feel it out and hope for the best, you know? You can't look under it to see if there's any damage. Um, so you might be overlooking a very serious problem on your mask and not realize that it is there. Another consideration for trying to decide between an attached overlay and a detached overlay is cost. With the attached overlay like this one, you're basically paying one price and it's a slightly discounted price because you get two units together as one. However, in the long run, that might not actually be cheaper. I find it's actually a little bit more cost effective for me personally to replace the mask as I need to and then just reuse my overlay again and again and again and again. I also find it being like less wasteful, but again, that's a personal choice. 
um, in terms of like cost effectiveness. I really hope that this was a helpful guide, it gives you some things to think about, some considerations, and now you can make an informed decision on what type of mask you want to buy. If you want some suggestions, there are some links below in the description. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. See you guys next time.